Okay. Okay. So welcome everybody to the Zoom lecture. Um, my name is Angel Salio and I, I am an Associate Professor of Roman Studies and Director of the Center for French and Francophone Studies at Duke University. It is my great pleasure to be launching today's a series on inequity on its contemporary forms with French historian Pap Ndiaye. A graduate from the Ecole Normale Supérieure of Fontenay-Saint-Cloud on an agrégé d'histoire, Pap Ndiaye is now a professor at the Institut d'études politiques in Paris. His work focuses on transnational histories and philosophies of race, drawing from American and French political experiences and thoughts especially as they apply to the African diaspora populations in both countries. He would like defining himself as, I quote, the product of French Republican meritocracy and American positive action, has worked extensively on the history of racially discriminatory practices in France and in America. Together with Patrick Lozès, NDI co-founded the Action Committee for the Promotion of Diversity in France. He has published numerous books, including La Démocratie en Amérique au XXe siècle, with Jean Effer and François Vell, Nylon, Nylon and Bombs, Dupont on the March of Modern America at Johns Hopkins University Press in 2007, La Condition Noire, Essay sur une minorité française, The Black Condition, Essay on a French Minority in 2008, Les Noirs Américains en marche pour les l'égalité in 2009, and Histoire de Chicago with Andrew Diamond in 2013. He served on the scientific committee of the exhibition Le Modèle Noir de Jericho à Matisse, The Black Model, from Jericho to Matisse, at the Orsay Museum in 2019, and co-edited the exhibition catalog, which I have to say is a wonderful one. Um, is timely a comic book on the history of voting rights in the US will be published in November. Professor Laurent Dubois from Duke, as well as Women Studies graduate student Samar Miled and Isabel Barley, uh, will open up the conversation after Professor Ndiaye's talk. If you wish to ask questions, please use the chat section of the Zoom platform. Note that the talk is also being recorded. And if uh, we are aiming at about, in terms of time, one hour and a half. And finally, please mark your agenda for the upcoming lectures of the series. On October 8, Didier Fassin, from, who holds the chair in public health at the Collège de France, will talk about biopolitics and unequal lives. And on October 29, philosopher Yala Kisukidi from Paris 8 will give a lecture on race and hospitality. And on November 12, philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy will discuss Les Fondements de l'Egalité, the Foundations of Equity. It will be in French, but with interpretation. And all lectures will be made available on the CFFS website. Thank you for being here today, and please join me in welcoming Professor Ndiaye for the beginning of this uh, of this lecture series, and we are very, very pleased to start it with him today. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Angel. It's, I hope you you hear me well. Um, it's a it's a great pleasure to uh, interact with you all um, from one side one side to the Atlantic Ocean uh, to the other. Although Angel, I, I've just we've just realized that Angel is lives uh, in the 19th arrondissement of Paris. So we're just a couple of miles apart. So uh, in fact, the 19th arrondissement is really the center of this, uh, one of the centers of this uh, uh, meeting uh, today. Uh, it's, it's quite funny. So I'm going to talk uh, today about the uh, movement Black Lives Matter in, in France. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it's pretty much a draft of, of a paper I'm planning to publish in, uh, the, uh, in, a, in a British uh, journal. Uh, and uh, I will be, of course, uh, very happy to um, uh, exchange ideas and some questions um, uh, once uh, my talk is over. Uh, so uh, let me uh, start with the, the introduction. And I'm gonna 
share the screen so that you should have access to the uh, PowerPoint presentation. Let me know if you see it. Uh, okay, no, it's not. It's not working. It works. It works. Uh, yeah. I don't. I. I just have a black. Okay. It. It seems to be working now. Do you. Do you see it? Do you see it? Yes, we see it. Okay. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. It's all good. <laughs> okay, but I. I now I don't see my. My paper. You know what you may have done. It's. Uh, do you have the PowerPoint? Have you already started the PowerPoint? You may have to pick yeah. a different a different screen to share, because um, what we see is um, like the PowerPoint screen, but not the yeah. PowerPoint itself. Do you know what I mean? Uh huh. So you, I'm not so sure if what... you if you stop sharing and then maybe you might need to pick okay. a different part of the screen. Do you see what I mean? Okay. 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 I see what you mean. Let me. Yeah, then. Um, let me see how you there. Okay, I have a problem because the. Okay. It, if I do that. Um, okay, what is it? Here. Do you hear me? Yes. Do you hear me? No? We do, yep. Yeah. We hear yep. you fine, yep. Yeah. Okay, there's an issue here. Are you having trouble sharing the screen or? Um. What's, what's the problem? Um, it's about sharing the screen. I think we just lost him. I actually think we just lost Pop. Yeah, he's trying to come in here. <laughs> we admit him back into the <laughs> technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, bonjour, Pop. On, we, we lost you for a sec. Are you back? <laughs> Okay, I, you need to, uh, do, have, you've, um, someone, actually, you know what, someone, uh, I, can, I, I will do this, sorry. I think that you were not allowed, there we go, okay. Um, okay, it works, yeah, right. because you need to activate my, my, my mic. Okay, okay. yeah, we're, okay, I get it. Oh, all right. I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, so I have a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but I realize that it's a little complicated to share this PowerPoint presentation because when I do it, I'm going to try again here. Okay. If you... I think someone suggested that you open up the presentation and then you share it. And I think that's yeah. a good suggestion. But, but you can already, also, or is it because you need to read your paper on the screen too? Is that the that's issue? Right, that's right. So I need to split the screen and I have my PowerPoint presentation, which is open. And I would like to share this PowerPoint with you. But if I share the screen, then I don't have access anymore to my talk uh in if you maybe can send me the the, the power presentation i could maybe share it oh, that, okay and you can start the talk should we do that okay let me do that then sorry for the snafu
almost. Okay, I've just sent it to you. Right. And you know what? I'm going to start my talk and then uh, I will catch up with uh, the slides. And there are some slides I would like you to see. Uh, there are, these are photographs of, the, of one uh, important uh, demonstration that took place in Paris in, in July. So I think that they are worth uh, having a look at too. Okay, let me start then. Um, so the, uh, the powerful movement, protest movement that followed the murder of George Floyd last May has had echoes around the world from Europe to Australia, from Brazil to India. In France too, major demonstrations have taken place much in uh, resonance with the American protest movement. In France, too, George Floyd has become a hero. On the whole, analysis of the movement have underlined its links with the American Black Lives Matter movement. And it is true that the reference do, to BLM USA is obvious uh, in France. Uh, you may notice, and it's quite interesting, I think, that the uh, demonstrations that took place in Paris and in major cities in France and across Europe for that matter, uh, are demonstrations in which the English language plays an important role. You, can, you could see signs with uh, English, um, English words uh, and I think that's pretty, pretty new in France. I, I don't have an experience of having this kind of multilingual uh, demonstrations such as the one that took place in, in, in Paris a few weeks ago. On the conservative side, commentators have insisted on the uniquely American dimension of, pro, of police brutalities uh, toward uh, black persons. The French government and the president himself have largely remained quiet, unlike other European politicians such as uh, Angela Merkel, or even Boris Johnson, who is not known to be uh, anti-Trump. On the other hand, on the left, commentators and activists have insisted on similarities between the American and French police practices. The French situation, of course, is different, but there are also deep issues of institutional racism in France, which the authorities don't want to hear about. Rather than a comparison between France and the United States, I would like to focus on the local dimension, so to speak. That is, the social protest movement that has taken place in France is not only linked to events taking place in the United States, it also has a local, a specific history, which is uh, important when analyzing what's going on in France. And of course, this uh, remark could be extended to all uh, situations throughout the world with the American echoes, but also the way local situations are interpreted and how local activists uh, use the US situation to uh, promote their uh, cause while having also a specific local history. It is therefore when analyzing and speaking of the large Black Lives Matter uh, sphere in, in France, it is also a French history. By French history, I do not mean a national history. That is something that, be, that would be closed on itself, but an imperial history that has its own dynamics, its own, own forms of, of violence. Of course, the American situation is very important, especially today, and it would be an obvious mistake to shift in, so, in some form of French exceptionalism. But I just want to insist on the French dynamic, 
which does not fully stem from the US situation. When speaking of its own forms of violence, uh, as, we will, as you will see, I, I, I include, of course, uh, the, 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 the colonial forms of violence and, and what colonialism uh, within, within the French empire has generated the, the specific forms of violence which have been generated by colonialism. So let me start with a few elements regarding this long history leading to BLM France, so to speak. When I say BLM France, I do not only speak of BLM as a movement in France, as a loosely organized movement in France, but I also include many small organizations which I will refer to later in my talk. First, um, this long history, this long durée um, from a historical standpoint um, can be analyzed through the uh, history of black um, activists and black political organizations in France. Uh, you may know that France has a long history of black movements and organizations, uh, which of course are most often studied and rightly so in transnational perspectives. Uh, indeed, uh, French black activists, whether in the colonial times or in the post-colonial period, have understood their activism as part of a larger perspective, using their foreign experience as a vantage point to fight discrimination and racism. It all started actually in the 1920s when numerous uh, associations negre, as they were called, uh, black associations, were created in France following the first Pan-African Congress held in Paris in 1919. W.E.B. Du Bois was in France, in Paris, in 1919. Soon afterwards, the Universal League of Defense of the Black Race, founded by Marron and Tuvalu, the Committee for the Defense of Blacks created by Sangor and Kouyaté, followed by the Union of uh, Black Workers, all these organizations in the 1920s were fairly tied or loosely tied, I should say, to the Communist Party, which encouraged their activities in the name of anti-colonialism while controlling also uh, their ideological line. Uh, the CP fearing the autonomization which would have threatened the unity of the proletarian class. You may know that the Third International uh, on the communist side had a black section headquartered in Hamburg, Germany until 1933 before moving to, to Paris. But the CP and its associated trade union and, uh, uh, and, and the Ministère des Colonies, the Ministry of Colonies, efficiently undermined black organization efforts during the interwar period. The Anglophone part of the history of black internationalism with George Padmore or C.L.R. James has been well studied, but we need to integrate better the French, the Portuguese, even the German parts of this story. If we do so, then uh, what we realize is that those organizations were very often discussing an issue which is not so well studied by historians, I think, which is the issue of the police, the relationship with the police, the relationship with the intelligence units of the Ministry of the Colonies. The archives are, are located in nearby uh, Paris, and you can read all the reports and all the, uh, the, the papers on these uh, Black activists and also the fact that these black activists were uh, complaining about uh, their uh, interactions uh, with uh, the police. In the mid 1930s, the difficulties encountered by black workers organizations led to the emergence of a more elitist intellectual and cultural movement, the Negritude. The Negritude was never formally organized, it remained a loose association of young black intellectuals and poets who never tried to organize a grassroots effort. However, the Negritude had 
most interesting political and cultural developments up to the end of the decolonization process in the early 1960s. Uh, in its early developments, the Negritude had a strong cultural dimension. It was first and foremost a way to celebrate black cultures that were ridiculed by the colonial exhibition of 1931 and other displays of colonial paternalism. It was also a way to fight the theories of assimilation, stating that blacks would enter civilization only by adopting European culture and ways of living. Uh, there are many, many quotes uh, regarding this cultural uh, dimension. There were no reform in views. The colonizers, uh, as Sangor says, legitimized our political and economic dependence by our cultural inferiority in order to create an effective revolution. Oops. But then... Mm, mm, mm. I let me... uh, your document. Yeah, but then I, I, sh I, okay, well, but then I lose my paper. Okay, so stop share then. Can you, can you, uh, let me see if I can, uh, so if I can maybe, uh, let, why, why, why don't you keep it just for a, uh, a few seconds so that we can, can you, can you move forward? Okay, I just want to show you, um, of, that's, uh, no, can you move, not, not so fast. Okay. Uh, okay, that's the first slide is a photograph of um, the, uh, the translation in French, in French of uh, 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 Let Us Breath. Uh, and obviously you can see the reference to George Floyd. Uh, here uh, you see the White House. So there is clearly uh, a, 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 an American dimension behind this. Can you move forward? Possibly the next to the next slide. Okay, that's the negritude movement, but we can we can move forward. That it's not crucial. Uh, yes, and uh, well, okay. Um, maybe we can. Can you end the 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 slides, and I we'll get back to it. Um, Thank you. Um, okay, um, yeah, in, in spite of their common cultural and political, uh, philosophical and political ground, two major currents can be analyzed within the Negritude uh, movement. Uh, the, the first approach uh, tried to define the black man, l'homme noir, with some specific psychological and mental characteristics to Sango. There is uh, uh, the idea of a black man with a specific connection to other human beings, far from the rationality and utilitarian mind, mind of the white man. On the other hand, Césaire uh, defines blackness first and foremost as a historical and, and social uh, experience. These are all debates that tended to um, sweep on the side some of the issues raised by the uh, more proletarian black organizations of the 1920s regarding their interaction with the French authorities the colonial uh, brutality, the colonial violence, the co um, negritude in the 1930s was not so much focusing on that. It, it would later in the 1950s with uh, Césaire writing his discours, discours uh, sur le colonialisme in the early uh, 1950s and Césaire, of course, emphasizing in discours sur le colonialisme the specific dimension of colonial violence, arguing, of course, as you may know, that the Second World War is the ensauvagement of Europe, as he said, Europe being becoming uh, uh, experiencing the uh, colonial violence it uh, inflicted onto uh, non-European people. This is uh, something which others did in the 1950s. I'm thinking of Hannah Arendt, for example, who also analyzed Nazism as 
uh, a form of colonial violence applied to the Europeans uh, themselves. This is, I don't want to delve too much into this uh, debate that, that is more complicated and they tended to not to focus on the uh, specificity of the, of the Nazi, uh, of Nazi forms of, of, of extreme violence, of course, but this is what Césaire writes when he focuses on colonialism. He writes also the discourse on the colonialism because uh, Césaire is uh, worrying uh, about the uh, forms of brutality that the police in Paris uses uh, when uh, trying to uh, repress the demonstrations taking place in Paris, the demonstrations by Algerians, for example, and the specificity of the violence and the specific weapons which the Paris police used uh, when repressing the uh, demonstrations and the activists, especially on the Algerian side with the, uh, the rise of the uh, Algerian uh, war. So uh, indeed, um, the, uh, this long durée history uh, is also that of uh, protest targeting police brutalities against colonial uh, subjects. I mentioned uh, uh, the 1920s, uh, the existence of a specific police unit in charge of surveillance of colonial subjects in, in Paris, mostly for political reasons. There are archives, whom I, which I mentioned, but historians of uh, the decolonization in the 1950s have also showed how in Paris, demonstrations against French colonialism uh, were brutally uh, repressed. Uh, the police, as I said, using specific firearms, which were not in use for classic demonstrations, demonstrations by trade unions, but even by the Communist Party protesting the war in Korea, and so on and so forth. Historian Emmanuel Blanchard has studied the riot of July of 1955 in uh, Paris, in Le Goutte d'Or neighborhood. I, I will show you a slide uh, later. And, and, and showing uh, the extreme brutality of the police as early as 1955, that is years before uh, the massacre of 1961. I will mention that later. Uh, in 1958, uh, there was a, a three policemen were killed in the 13th arrondissement and a fourth one was killed in uh, Vincennes and the police, uh, the chief of police, Maurice Papon, retaliated with massive raids of, on Algerian people in Paris and its suburbs more than 5,000 Algerians were detained in a former hospital, in a gymnasium, and in the Veldiv, the Veldiv being notorious because this is the place where the Jewish population of Paris was also detained um, in 1942 uh, before being sent to extermination camps. Uh, the uh, Japi, the gymnasium was also used as a detention center during the uh, Second World War. Uh, maybe we can watch, can we switch to a few slides, please? Angel? Just doing it. Great. Can you see it? Yep. Okay. Can you, okay, can you just move backward just by one slide? Uh, okay, so I, 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 right, let's, that's here. That, that's one photograph uh, in a newspaper in 1955 uh, following the, uh, the roundup of uh, Algerian um, activist 
uh, and beyond activists, many, many people were also arrested uh, following this uh, uprising in the Good Door, the Good Door being a very popular migrant neighborhood in uh, northern uh, Paris. Uh, can you move forward just one slide? There is also, which is something, no, you can, you can stay on the previous slide. Um, the massacre of October 17th, 1961 is uh, well known since uh, uh, the Algerians uh, and the FLN, that is the um, organization uh, fighting French colonialism, organized a massive demonstration uh, on this day and the police uh, brutally repressed uh, the uh, demonstrators and you can see a famous photograph here, Ici on Noir les Algériens, something that was painted on a bridge in Paris. Here, the Algerians are, are being uh, thrown in the Seine River, are, are being thrown. Uh, and in fact, uh, most likely, it's unclear, but uh, several hundred uh, people were uh, killed this night, uh, this uh, uh, tragic night of October uh, 1961. Uh, uh, many, many corpses uh, were found along the Seine River all the way to uh, the sea. Uh, and this uh, massacre was uh, organized by uh, Maurice Papon. That's a photograph of Maurice Papon, who was the police chief of Paris at that time, the prefet, the police, Maurice Papon, is also notorious for having uh, collaborated with the Nazis uh, during the war and later, uh, not so long ago, he passed away uh, years ago, but before he passed away, he was uh, put on trial for a crime against uh, humanity and he was uh, sentenced uh, precisely because he participated in the deportation of the uh, of hundreds of uh, Jewish uh, persons uh, during the war, so Papon managed to survive the end of the war and 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 uh, join and and in fact uh, move on in his uh, career as a, as a, as a policeman as a as a high level uh, civil servant, and he uh, eventually uh, engineered uh, the repression. Uh, which uh, Algerians uh, faced and people protesting the French colonization or the French uh, war in Algeria. He engineered the massive repression uh, that took place uh, at that time. And here, this is a, a point I want to stress, which is uh, that um, the uh, years between 1955, especially 1957, when the war got very bloody in Algeria, and the early uh, 1960s were really bloody wars with many, many people killed, not only in Algeria, obviously, but also uh, in, in France. And I often tell my students that uh, at the same time, the uh, civil rights movement uh, in uh, the United States was, was of course, uh, very important and on the rise and many, many activists were killed, uh, of course, in the U.S. South uh, at that time, uh, most often in, 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 in highly brutal ways. But when looking at the situation on the French side, we should not forget that also many, many people were killed uh, at that time, hundreds of people were also killed in, in France. And this is something I tell my students because they tend to imagine the US as the country of violence and the country of uh, repression, the country of, uh, of, uh, uh, of systematic uses of violence. And, and, and they tend to forget that on the French side, uh, violence was also uh, developed on, on a massive scale. What uh, Emmanuel Blanchard and others, historians of colonial violence, have insisted on to is also that colonial violence means the use of uh, weapons which are not commonly used in the non-colonial forms of violence, as I said, 
but it also means that the authority to use uh, the most lethal forms of violence can be attributed or can be transferred to uh, civilians. Uh, the um, specificity of colonial violence is that civilians, um, colonizers, uh, also participate in, the, uh, in a legitimate way, uh, in a legal way, in the, um, in the use of uh, violence they are the help uh, the army they, they 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 also can boost like in algeria the, the morale of the army when needed they can push for even more lethal forms of of violence and this uh, history of colonial violence should not be only seen onto the colonial territories but it should also be seen and expanded to the whole empire, including uh, metropolitan France, where the use of colonial violence was also widespread in the 1950s and early 1960s. Is it true only for the Algerians and the Algerian war? Well, the Algerian war is very central in this story for sure, but it's not only the Algerian war. Uh, other activists, activists from the West Indies, for example, and I'm thinking here of the uprising in Martinique in 1959, the uprising in Guadeloupe in 1967, all those uprisings were repressed in, with using uh, violence that was, that was not uh, common for, uh, or very rare or non-existent for uh, non-colonial forms of uh, protest. So we should, we should see uh, these uh, forms of violence at the scale of the empire, including the overseas uh, departments, including also <coughs> the uh, migrants from the West Indies that started to arrive on a massive scale in the early 60s with the Bumidom movement and also started to organize politically. It is fascinating to look at the archives of the police in, in Paris, the prefecture, the police, which is nearby, where you find all those reports regarding the West Indians, Martinique, Guadeloupéen, often close to the French Communist Party, but having their own organization, student organizations, etc and seeing uh, how closely watched uh, they were and, and, and what uh, policemen and, and surveillance unit did uh, to these uh, young men and, and women uh, using illegal means uh, and uh, practicing forms of, uh, again, of violence that were not, um, that were not uh, imposed on um, non-colonial activists of all kind, whatever they may be. Can we move forward by one slide, if it's possible? Yes, I want also to mention here uh, the uh, mobilization of African migrants in the 1970s. African migrants started to arrive in France in the early 60s, uh, following the decolonization and the independence of many African, well, most uh, Afri former African uh, colonies on the French side and the British side. Uh, and migrants started to arrive in the 1960s, only men, as they were supposed to work for a few years in metropolitan France before returning to their uh, native um, uh, countries. And these migrants uh, were um, uh, hosted in uh, the Foyer Sonacotra, that is, there's uh, projects where they were all concentrated in industrial cities or in the suburbs of Paris. Some of them were even in Paris. And these, and these projects um, housing the uh, African migrants, these projects were also under tight surveillance, most often by former policemen uh, coming from Algeria or soldiers coming from the colonial areas who were supposed to be uh, uh, used 
to uh, dealing with these African migrants. So in the 1970s, African migrants rebelled against uh, these watchmen, this closed surveillance of civilians, the, the former policemen, as I said, uh, so as to get more freedom, so as to have the possibility to have their own, um, their own kitchen, uh, to cook their, their own food. Uh, there are a number of practical issues around this rebellion of the uh, African migrants in the 1970s. This was also a time of uh, police brutality, for sure. Uh, the uh, police being most often tied to the watchmen of the projects. They were all policemen or former uh, policemen and the police uh, entering these projects without uh, legal authorization and using means that were obviously uh, prohibited by law. So there is a long history of uh, colonial brutalities, I would argue, in metropolitan France that started in the colonial um, areas, in the colonial empire, and, and spread, so to speak, to uh, metropolitan France uh, in starting in the 1920s, uh, but accelerating in the 1950s, 60s, uh, and 1970s. Can we move forward, please? Okay. And all right, so if we, no, can you get backward, please? Uh, no, 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 it's, you're moving forward here. Yeah, back, 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 again, back here. Uh, here, thank you. Uh, uh, 2005 is um, obviously a turning point and is most often seen as a search since this was the, uh, the year when two um, teenagers were killed in an electric plant after being chased by the police in a Paris suburbs in northern Paris uh, in the uh, fall of 2005 and a massive uprising took place uh, at that time and the, the whole country, um, suburbs, uh, housing projects, uh, uh, poor neighborhoods erupted with uh, violence uh, to pro and, and, and protest against uh, police uh, brutality against uh, race profiling and more generally uh, the um, discriminations which many of these young French men and women were facing in their everyday life whether uh, for the um, uh, for the uh, uh, to access the uh, job market uh, well that's the job market Second, uh, the access to um, housing, to the housing market. And third, their relationship with the police and race profiling. These were the three main issues which uh, these um, young men and women were protesting against in 2005. And this ignited a massive debate in France and some changes, most often cosmetic changes, when it comes to fighting discrimination, fighting racial discrimination. And I say cosmetic changes, it's all the more true when it comes to uh, the police brutality and police behavior. Can we move forward, please? Um, the death of Adama Traoré in July of 2016 is also an important uh, moment. Adama Traoré is not, just like George Floyd, is not by far the first person to die in extremely uh, debatable uh, circumstances, to say the least, uh, when it comes to Adama Traoré, who, uh, whose uh, chest was crushed in a Paris police station uh, four years ago. And this generated uh, demonstrations, and I participated in many of these demonstrations. Uh, at that time, you can see a photograph uh, taken in uh, July of 2016 
uh, or August, uh, if I'm if I if I'm correct, uh, a few weeks following the death of uh, Adama uh, Traoré, uh, sections of Black Lives Matter France were created also in 2016, including one uh, section of BLM France at Sciences Po, uh, where uh, I teach, which is very uh, active. So this is really the rise of a, of a, of a movement uh, specifically focusing on the issue of race profiling by the police and police brutality, which uh, is a daily experience for so many young uh, French uh, non-whites, especially people seen as black or Arabs, young blacks and Arabs in France are targeted uh, by the police and harassed on an everyday basis. We have so many testimonies, statistics are are, are also quite clear uh, when looking at the Paris at the Paris station train station in northern Paris. Um, some uh, research sociologists have uh, calculated that a black person is between eight and twenty times more likely to be uh, arrested uh, and harassed by the police than a, a white person. So we have some statistics, obviously showing that the police behaves in a very uh, brutal way. It is interesting also to look at the uh, trade union uh, police uh, magazines uh, who are most often fairly proud of their own history, who never hesitate to uh, mention what the police did in Paris and elsewhere in the 1950s and 70s uh, to maintain order as the official word says, but obviously it was a way to uh, control and to um, uh, exert, um, uh, to repress the anti-colonial demonstrations of the time. So I'm not the only one, quite obviously, to make a connection between the old colonial forms of violence, which I talked about, and the new forms of violence uh, so-called new forms or recent current forms of violence used uh, by the uh, French police. The policemen themselves uh, do it. And obviously there, are, there is a specific issue when it comes to the uh, police behavior vis-a-vis -vis non whites especially uh, blacks and Arabs, especially males, actually. Can we move forward? Uh, I want, uh, this is a Paris mural uh, that was done uh, by a famous artist named J.R. in, 20, in uh, this uh, summer with uh, the eyes of uh, uh, George Floyd and, and Adama Traoré. Floyd and Traoré being uh, together literally most of the time in the demonstrations but also in murals uh, and artists have done quite a work uh, in Paris and other, and other cities in, in France. Can we move forward? I want to show you a few, uh, a few photographs uh, of the uh, largest demonstration that took place in Paris in June of um, 2020, uh, shortly following the murder of George Floyd, but also following uh, uh, the uh, Adama Traoré uh, committee, I will say a word about that. Uh, and clearly you can see what I said, that is the connection, the, the use of the English and French. Uh, je suis de la couleur de ceux qu'on tue et persécute. I'm the color, I'm, I'm, I, my color is that of people being killed and persecuted. Uh, we can breath. Can we move forward? Uh, just one slide, you see um, la police tue, c'est écrit blanc sur noir, police kills. Uh, maybe we can move forward also, showing the next one, a photograph with uh, George Floyd uh, and Black Lives Matter in the background. Maybe another one. I can breath, you see justice. Another one. Je veux respirer, the French translation for I can breath, of course. Uh, who do you call when the 
when the police murders, um, I'm not sure what, what this woman means here, but it's, while well, the meaning is quite obvious, the, the specifics is a little unclear. Uh, can we move forward? Uh, you see uh, Black Lives Matter signs everywhere. Can you move forward? Okay, uh, Justice pour Adama Traoré is, and, and people uh, uh, kneeling in front of the of the police and and and, and protesting each time, uh, making a connection between George Floyd and Adama Traoré. It's one and the same for the demonstrators. Uh, maybe one. I'm not sure if it's the last one. Okay. Can you? Thank you, Angel. Can you end the show so that I can get back to my to my talk? I had to improvise a bit with the the slides. Okay. Uh, what I want to say is the last uh, the last moment is uh, so I spoke about the long history of we colonial. We can't see you anymore. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. I spoke about the long history of colonial slash post-colonial violence. Um, and I want to speak a bit about the recent uh, emergence of grassroots associations, such as the Adama Traoré Committee, uh, which have uh, questioned in very uh, smart ways the classic French republicanism. For this new generation of activists, Republican universalism, the French Republican universalism, has in fact hidden the reality of discrimination. And it is now denounced as a white male form of universalism, blind to the experience of non-whites in France. Uh, in, in a way that, um, uh, well, let me say a few words about the Adama Traoré Committee, which is headed by the sister, of uh, Adama uh, Traoré, and uh, this young woman has managed something which is very rare, in fact, and I don't think it could exist uh, in a protest movement. That is that um, uh, having our uh, protests and demonstrations which are growing in importance and size over time, the small demonstrations took place following the murder of Adama Traoré in July of 2016, and the largest demonstration took place following the murder of George Floyd in, June, in May of 2020. So the Adama Traoré, in fact, a committee managed to do something that is quite extraordinary. That is, it, it, they managed to make Adama Traoré more well-known now in France in 2020, than it was back in 2016. They have managed to enlarge the uh, political basis of activists and people of all kind who support uh, the Adama Traoré uh, Committee four years follow after uh, the death of Adama Traoré. So this is, of course, because of the murder of George Floyd, but what the Adama Traoré managed is to move forward and make Adama Traoré not completely swept under the rug. He was very much there as much as George Floyd in the demonstration. I was at this demonstration and when arriving by the metro, uh, the metro was full of people. The train stations, the underground train stations were full of people. And I was wondering what was, going, what, what was going on. And I was wondering if there was something else going on uh, uh, in the neighborhood or in the northwestern part of Paris. But all these people were going to the demonstration. And may, many people couldn't even access to the area where the demonstration uh, took place. The police said officially 20,000 people, but way more people, in fact, showed up in, in spite of the fact that this demonstration was officially illegal as the chief police declared that the, the demonstration was illegal because of COVID uh, concerns, health uh, concerns. So it, clearly uh, the, the, the accomplishment of the Adama Traoré was to uh, uh, make Adama Traoré 
even more central uh, than uh, back in uh, 2016. So what we need to do, of course, is to uh, study and to look at the uh, Adama uh, Traoré. And let me, I'm sorry, I just need to make sure that my computer doesn't Is not is not turning off because the the battery is. Excuse me, just one second. Here. Okay, so the Atama Traoré uh, committee uh, is in need to be uh, studied, and I have a student who is planning to do that. Uh, and, and, and look at the ways they have managed not only to survive, but to grow and develop around the situation of Adama Traoré and others also who were, uh, who um, have been uh, brutalized and some, sometimes who died when in police station and elsewhere. Let me uh, conclude. Uh, let me find uh, here. Um, okay. Um, so the old anti-racist associations, such as the League of, of Human Rights, um, associations uh, which were so deeply involved into, but in, in a ambiguous ways, into. Uh, anti-colonial uh, activities in the 1950s uh, and in the 1960s have kept uh, an interest on what's going on in France, but they have not been able to adapt well to the new demands of a new generation where young women are highly visible, uh, less concerned with the ideological fight against racism than with the fight against discrimination and race profiling. The general old-style anti-racist associations have lost a lot of ground over the last 20 years, and they are struggling to rebuild, and strong, to rebuild a strong and representative militant basis in uh, the uh, popular neighborhoods where non-whites uh, live. So clearly, uh, new associations such as the uh, Adama Traoré uh, Committee are on the rise. They focus on specific forms of uh, racism and specific forms of brutality. I spoke with some activists of the Adama Traoré uh, Committee, uh, asking, asking them if they were planning to expand their activism to other forms of discrimination and for now they said that they want to focus on their uh, know-how so to speak that is their um, uh, the, 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 the police brutality race profiling although they are also interested in larger forms of discrimination in the housing market and in the, in the job market but they want to 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 to, to stay focused on the issue of police brutality. I also spoke to them, um, I, it was on the phone actually last uh, week, about the relationship with uh, uh, American organizations, with uh, BLM in the United States, with uh, American activists. They have some connections and uh, there were quite a few Americans actually uh, in June, uh, students, American students uh, stuck in, in Paris because of, of the COVID. Uh, for example, so there were quite a few uh, 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 American people interested in these uh, issues, but there are no strong, as far as I can say, there are no strong um, connections yet between uh, BLM France and uh, BLM uh, USA, although BLM USA is talking about expanding in, in, in Europe, so it's, it's on the rise, it's not done yet, but it would rebuild some kind of transatlantic conversation on these topics that started in the 1920s uh, a century ago. So to uh, sum up my, my uh, position, I would argue that yes, uh, the murder of George Floyd was crucial 
in the reawakening and the growth of uh, uh, a strong anti-racist movement, especially uh, facing and uh, fighting anti-black racism uh, in France since uh, May, late May and June of 2020. Uh, but in the same time, this uh, reawakening is part of a long history, a long French uh, history, which is also very much connected to colonialism and the specific forms of violence that were um, uh, that uh, colonial subjects uh, experienced in metropolitan France or in the colonies for that matter uh, for uh, much of the uh, 20th uh, century. Thank you. And sorry for the uh, technical issues I had to, well, it's, it's, it was a little complicated from a technical standpoint, but I guess you, you heard me. Thank you so much, Pop. I hope you hear a round of virtual applause from, <laughs> from the group. And uh, we, uh, we used some bricolage and made it work. So thank, but thank you so much for a very interesting um, historical investigation and, and thoughts. Um, we are now going to open it up for questions. So if you start, you can start putting your questions in the chat, but to open up the discussion first, we have Samar Miled and Isabel Bradley who will be responding and sharing a few thoughts just to open the discussion. And I will be gathering questions from the chat. Uh, so please put your questions there and then I will pose them to Pop as well. So um, thank you. Um, Samar, do you wanna start? Sure. Um, thank you, Bob. Everything you said was really incredibly useful, um, especially um, because I was thinking, I was listening, I was thinking, um, in order for us to understand the present, it is very important for us to understand the past. And I think the fact that you talked about the colonial past and the post-colonial past and violence is very important. I was curious, I guess this is my first question, if we are trying today to, us as thinkers, as historians, as students, as educators, if our main, um, if our priority today is to educate a new generation or to build a new generation aware of what is happening, are we, how are we actually educating it? this generation. So I, my first question for you as a historian, maybe from your own experience is, how are we teaching history in France? And are we including this colonial past and this post-colonial violence in our curriculums today in France? I have a, a small idea about the issue in the US, but I'm very curious to know how it is in France today. Um, and I guess my second question and related to education, I was thinking of the role of the media and how today the dialogue is open, but we only hear from everything going on in the streets through the media. And we all know that it's very important and the media could be a very informative source, but it could also be very dangerous due to fake news. This is very important here in the US and we all talk about these fake news. And thinking about this, I was, um, you mentioned colonial violence and brutal police brutality. And I was, um, I was watching, I watch um, the, the news every night and I always hear about looting and break-ins and how protesters and demonstrators in the US and in France can be violent. And I was thinking about this violence in response to violence. So the, if let's suppose that this violence is real and that it exists. Um, to what extent can we say that the demonstrator's violence or violence and resistance is a language and is accurate and should exist? And obviously here I'm thinking I have Fanon in mind and all his theory on violence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samar. Um, the first question, how are we teaching, how are we teaching history in, in France? Uh, well, this is a very hotly debated issue with uh, um, some um, conservatives complaining that um, um, colonial history uh, should be taught, uh, emphasizing the positive dimension of colonial history, what the French brought uh, to uh, Africa and other parts of the world, and complaining that uh, colonial history is too much of a history that uh, focuses on the 
on the dark side of, of French history, when uh, others, uh, more progressive people, uh, think that colonial history is not taught uh, the way it should and is not taught enough in uh, middle school and uh, not so well taught at the university level, although things are on the rise. So this is not only an academic issue, this is also a highly political issue, given also the centrality of the education system. You know that there, is a, there are national programs in history, so these, these national programs are also uh, debated at the highest level. The, the president, the minister of education decides what is to be taught to uh, French uh, children, so there, there is a, 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 a kind of a direct centralized way of uh, teaching history at the secondary level, uh, which is vastly different, of course, from, from what you have in, in the US. But uh, clearly, uh, these are issues that uh, I think, from my perspective, need to be taught, need to be discussed especially uh, the, the issue of violence, which is often downplayed or, or, or often swept on the side or often assimilated to war, when a war obviously is not the only form of, of violence. The role of the media, I don't think that fake news are so, uh, you know, so prevalent uh, here, much less than in, 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 the, in the US, I would say. Uh, well, you have uh, uh, you have the, 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 the central power is a producer of fake news in the United States with the White House uh, making fake news every day. So at least we don't have that uh, in, in France. Uh, but um, I would emphasize here the importance of the, of the internet, the social media, uh, not so much Facebook, but Instagram and what uh, young people uh, uh, communicate with each other. Uh, for example, the demonstration that was organized in Paris, uh, in, 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 that were organized in June and, and July, um, um, the news spread through uh, Instagram, WhatsApp groups, and etc. And, and the police was, uh, was, uh, uh, was not able to, to, to have a, 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 a clear understanding of what was uh, going on. Uh, violence as a language, um, and, and you, you're right to think of uh, Fanon in this respect, uh, in the Fanon of the Dane uh, de, de la Terre. When looking at the demonstrations, I cannot say that there's, uh, the demonstrations were, were violent. Uh, the, the, the demonstrations were remarkably uh, peaceful uh, on, uh, on the whole. Uh, with a few things uh, at the end of the demonstrations uh, as usual, but something overall uh, very, very uh, peaceful and, uh, and it was quite uh, striking to see uh, uh, the size and also how, how people were, um, um, were, were serene, and, 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 but also, uh, of course, extremely, extremely, uh, uh, angry and, and, and they were they were shouting they were, they were the, the noise was was extremely strong there, there was also some music but but uh, it, 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 it was it was very peaceful uh, I, I think and and it, and it remained uh, peaceful uh, throughout uh, the summer uh, I, I cannot think of any violent uh, episode. Uh, that took place. Uh, so that could be also possibly uh, a, a difference with some events that have taken place in the United States, although I would also argue that on the American side, uh, the uh, demonstrators have been uh, massively uh, uh, peaceful uh, uh, and, and, and have used nonviolent forms of, of protest. Great. Uh, Isabel, do you want to go ahead? And we do have, I am getting questions in the chat. You do need to, it seems like you will need to just send them to me privately, but I do, I am receiving your questions and we'll ask them in a moment. So, but Isabel, Isabel go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Ndiaye, for this talk that really situates the current movements within long durée histories and inspired a lot of questions for me. Um, so I've been thinking about 
French history where colonial conquest and racialization are more spatially ordered in a center periphery model. So you have colonial exhibitions in, in the metropole in Paris as a meeting place for anti-colonial intellectuals, but it's sort of the 20th century that colonial exploitations that were once overseas and continents away start to come. Um, and you mentioned specific types of policing tied to race that expand into metropolitan France, like the Algerian protests at the same time as the civil rights movement, roughly. But in this example, um, the Algerian protests are tied to French occupation of Algerian territory, whereas Jim Crow is it's more spatially distributed in a context where the occupation is not overseas. The sort of military occupation and surveillance of black life is much more, I guess, immediate in a geographical sense. Um, so thinking about space and processes of racialization in the French colonial context versus a US context where this history of violence towards black lives is it's tied to settler colonialism and imperialism, but there's less overt um, center periphery structure. Um, but then seeing that both of these models end up leading to very similar forms of segregation, ghettoization, um, brutalization. And this led me to the issue of surveillance and mobility and visibility. So how these current movements for black life are dialoguing across national boundaries, as you mentioned, they're drawing on traditions of activism that have learned to mobilize public and urban space. And you showed um, those really powerful images of art and murals where certain refrains are, are retranslated, certain images keep circulating. I can't breathe, j'arrive pas à respirer. Adam Traoré becomes George Floyd. And so there's also this, this question of language where they cross into different spaces. Um, so I guess generally my question is, um, how do current activists mobilize spatially to gain visibility, but more specifically, what are the differences in how this might happen in a context where French colonial violence um, continues often to be removed overseas or even confined to the banlieue? So strategies for visibility in movements for Black lives and how they might differ in the US and, and French context. Yeah. Sorry, that was yeah. kind of a long thought, but... <laughs> no, no, that's, that's great. Thank you so much, Isabel. What I would, uh, what I would say is, is um, actually uh, something quite similar to place in the United States, meaning that the Adama Traoré Committee, for example, uh, carefully chose uh, the areas where to demonstrate. A few years ago, people would demonstrate in the suburbs that is pretty much where the events took place, where Adama Traoré was uh, murdered uh, in a police station north of Paris. When uh, in 2020, in June and July, people demonstrated in Paris within city limits in way more central neighborhoods, which was, very, which, which was a, a smart move. And I'm comparing that to the uh, United States because many uh, Black Lives Matter um, protest took place in, um, for example, on Michigan Avenue in, in Chicago or in Philadelphia uh, near Rittenhouse Square and not in North Philadelphia and so on and so forth. So carefully chosen uh, central neighborhood which were easily of easy access for anyone who wanted to uh, participate in the demonstration when uh, having access to clichy sous bois for example, north of Paris, is not easy at all. It, it's complicated, so it was very smart to move to uh, downtown uh, Paris. Uh, it was a way to attract a lot of people, and I would argue it was also a way to avoid the most uh, brutal forms of police uh, brutality or police violence. Uh, within city limits, with the TV cameras on, with so many people, including white people, it is not as easy uh, to get in a brutal way on the demonstrators when, uh, in fact, a few years ago, when demonstrations took place in clichy sous bois the police had way more possibilities to repress. So I think that the geography 
is quite important when uh, analyzing the strength and the size of the protest movement in France. And it seems to me that it's also the case in, uh, in uh, the uh, United States. I'm not sure whether the French were inspired by, by what was taking place in uh, the United States. I published a, a paper in Le Monde in, by early June focusing on the urban geography of uh, demonstrations taking place in, uh, in, in the United States uh, and suggesting that it was a good idea to demonstrate in the, at the, in the center of, of Paris, even if the demonstration is illegal. So I was very happy to see that it, it happened. It's not my paper, but it just happened. And they were smart enough to realize that this was the thing to do as a way to avoid violence and also a way to attract people. Thank you. I mean, those are great opening questions and we have a number of really interesting ones coming in the chat. Um, there's two that have to do with the police themselves. One, which is sort of a specific question about whether the same kind of issue happens in France where police aren't charged, right, in cases of violence, the kind of, you know, such that, that question, right, of, of kind of um, the lack yeah. of accountability. And secondly, about police responses to demonstrations. I think you've already started to, to, to just sort of answer that, but I just wanted to, someone else had asked that question. Um, mm -hmm. So that first question, the second question um, that I'll put together too, and just sort of put on the table, I think it's quite interesting. And it relates to Isabel's question as well, which is sort of the, the different kind of politics of the gesture of, of kneeling in particular, right? The kind of, mm -hmm. uh, kind of kneeling in protest, how that, how that travels, why that travels, how it's been used in France. Um, and I guess that just opens up to, uh, there's a couple of really interesting questions on the table about, you know, kind of Black Lives Matter in France drawing on American examples as opposed to French colonial examples, right? So this kind of question of like, what are the so genealogies the of protests and why, um, you know, is that, is it positive to draw on the American examples or maybe what might be the power of, 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 of delving into the very history that you yourself were we're indicating. So I'll put those on the table and I'll keep gathering them. So please right. keep them coming. Yeah. Fantastic questions. Uh, uh, is the, the French police uh, accountable and charged? Um, no, not really. I mean, it's not as bad as in the United States. Uh, sometimes the policemen can be uh, fired, for example, or can be charged with uh, uh, some form of uh, um, some form of responsibility, uh, but usually uh, the police gets away uh, with the murder, so to speak, uh, in France, uh, just like uh, in uh, the United States. And uh, that is why the Adama Traoré committee was created, because they want the truth, as they say, and they don't, uh, <coughs> they don't buy the official word saying that Adama Traoré died of natural causes you don't die of natural causes with your chest crushed, right? And he was a young man in his 20s with no uh, known health uh, issues. So there are similarities, although the situation in the United States, depending on where, of course, but globally speaking, the situation in the US is, is, uh, is worse. Kneeling in protest is interesting because it really uh, comes from the United States. There's no... Uh, I, I have, I've never seen any form of kneeling uh, before Colin Kaepernick uh, did that, uh, this football player for the 49ers. This was back in 2016, if I remember well. And kneeling started around 2016, uh, and it started among uh, um, many of these youngsters who like, uh, I'm not sure about American football, but they are most often fans of uh, uh, the uh, NBA and, 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 and the protest taking place in, 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 in sports right now, and especially in pro basketball, are of uh, primary importance given the uh, global influence of uh, pro American pro uh, basketball. Now, the question, um, you're absolutely right, saying that the, the French anti-racist movement, including BLM France, has most often um, uh, used and relied on American uh, references. 
uh, and you may have, and you noticed the use of we can breath and 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 as I said the the English language being so central in those demonstrations with very few references to the colonial past but this is uh, this speaks volume in fact about the lack of proper references the lack of uh, national references for anti uh, um, uh, um, for uh, anti-racist uh, activists. From the French uh, standpoint, uh, the history of anti-racism in the United States is a history of defeats, is a history of uh, tragic uh, events, but it's also a history of heroes. It's a history of uh, uh, victories. When uh, from the French standpoint, uh, the anti-racist movement doesn't have a history of victories that would be comparable. We don't have a civil rights movement. We don't have, according to, you know, in the French uh, perspective, there's larger than life uh, heroes of the 1960s and uh, earlier period uh, on the American side. So the uh, there, there, there is a, a, an American history of, uh, of uh, anti-racist uh, victories which the French like to rely on because of, not of a lack of victories when it comes to anti-racism. Think, of course, of the decolonization movement, but the decolonization movement is not seen as an anti-racist victory. The decolonization movement is the is about the dissolution of the French empire. So what we need very much is not, of course, to uh, sweep on the side the American reference. It is so powerful, as we have seen following the death of George Floyd. But we also need to promote a local history that we could be proud of, not something we should be ashamed of, because this local history is not only a history of defeats, but it can also be seen as a history of victories when it comes to the decolonization movement. So clearly there is something at stake, very important at stake regarding what you earlier, what you said earlier, uh, Samar, regarding the, 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 the way the history of decolonization is taught in France. Uh, it's, it's, a little, it's taught a little bit as a defeat for the country and the, 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 the French power, et cetera, et cetera, when we need, in fact, to, to rebuild this, this history and, and, and demonstrate that uh, the uh, history of French anti-racism uh, can also be seen as a, as a history with um, heroes, so to speak, all right, for kids, uh, with victories, uh, with things that can be compared to what happened in the United States, even if in France, as you rightly said, Isabel, we haven't had the uh, legal forms of segregation that existed in the United States. And we have this kind of separation between the colonial and the national uh, with the overseas areas with uh, the, the, the colonies. So I'm not saying that these histories are one and the same, but Clearly, we should, uh, we should uh, promote in a more effective way uh, the, the long history of uh, anti-colonialism as well as the long history of uh, French anti-racism uh, because it's an interesting history. Thank you for those. Look, I, we have about five minutes left. I have a bunch of questions, so I will pose two. Um, connected ones um, and see if we can get any more in. One has to do with the, the role of women and the, in particular the sort of brutalization of women by the carceral state and obviously the centrality of women in the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and the, the questioners are sort of, but at the same time, a lot of the focus is on the kind of violence done to, to men. And the question is kind of, is that also true in France? Is there kind of this, how does this kind of question of gender operate in the movement? Um, and then a second question, I think, two powerful questions, really. One is um, one 
uh, one questioner kind of raised the fact that you talked about cosmetic changes in 2005. And then another has asked, you know, how do we take this window of opportunity and make sure that something really happens, right? So what are the policies or institutional changes that you think would carry this momentum of the social movement in France and, and you know, bring about real change? Um, so I, I think those two are already big questions. So I'll, I'll ask those. Uh, yes, the role of women is crucial. BLM France is, is I would argue, possibly 70% uh, uh, um, made of female activists. Uh, and uh, it is such a strong uh, contrast with earlier anti-racist uh, organizations and movements where uh, women were, of course, present, but they were uh, completely secondary and and uh, and uh, the rise of uh, feminism in France, uh, just like the rise of feminism or the second wave feminism in the United States, can also be tied to the disappointment and sometimes the bitterness of um, uh, female activists in anti-racist movements in France that were tired of uh, being uh, behind men and 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 seen as a, a second-rate uh, activists. So clearly women are on the front line, which is very interesting. And there's a rise of Afro-feminism uh, in France, which is uh, very, very interesting with a new generation of extremely uh, radical um, black women uh, doing all kinds of things uh, and most often being at odds with the, the French uh, state. That's quite, uh, that's quite uh, striking. And yet, yes, there's a, a contrast or um, a contradiction, so to speak, with violence done to men. But uh, race profiling is not only, um, it's not only about men. Young women can also be race uh, profiled. And uh, the different forms of police brutality uh, can also uh, affect uh, women. Uh, they can have effects on larger groups, on, on, on families of course, and uh, women uh, can also uh, be um, objects to various forms of police uh, brutality. It could be symbolic forms of brutality, insults, uh, for example, and sometimes physical forms of brutality. For example, the fact that the frisk, the frisk and stop policy uh, of, of, of women who have complained of being uh, raped, uh, so to speak, or sexually assaulted, by policemen in uh, police uh, stations. What institutional changes will make police accountable, uh, resist the uh, pressure from the police unions, which are very powerful in France, as well as in the United States, as, uh, as I understand, and that they have some heavy pressure onto the Ministry of Domestic Affairs. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, we also need uh, more statistics, uh, so-called uh, uh, ethnic statistics. The, that's the way the French call them, that there are more racial statistics that we need to understand better and also uh, to promote significant changes within the French police. The British uh, did that with uh, statistics uh, introduced in the 1990s uh, that uh, provides a basis on which you can ask for significant change when most often, when interviewed, the police uh, union says, well, it's just a bad apple uh, within the bag of uh, apples. So statistics, of course, provide a different story. And I mentioned the statistics done regarding race profiling at the uh, Paris uh, station that was done a few years ago. So we need more studies, we need also uh, to resist the pressures uh, from the union. In fact, if I had to sum it up, um, we need to, uh, as I told, uh, uh, I was interviewed for that a few weeks ago, uh, and I, I, I think that police issues should be part of the democratic conversation, should be included uh, in the programs of uh, of different candidates when there is a presidential election or whatever, when in fact, nowadays, these issues are never discussed. They are uh, left to the police. They are left to the high level civil servants. They need, the, the citizens need to discuss these issues. 
the issue of the, the, the control of the police is a democratic issue and it should be part of the democratic debates, the democratic conversation, especially during uh, the election years. So to me, that's the bottom line. Well, thank you so much. And it is 1.30. You ended, I think, on a really powerful note. I really, I personally really appreciated this today. I think we all did. I, maybe I'll ask Angail if you want to say final words, but thank you very much all, and all for your questions as well. Thank you so much for your questions. Just wonderful questions, actually. Thank you so much, uh, Patendiai, for this wonderful talk. And I think I, I really uh, think it's very important for students as well to have these connections between forms of violence, the colonial violence that was very present in, in the metropole, but often we, there's a collective memory has completely erased it. And I was thinking when you mentioned uh, the 17 October, I was thinking of this great film, but also tragic film by Jacques Panigel, October à Paris, which I often study with my students. And this is also you know, talking about space, this shows you like the repression and how it was in fact completely specialized during the, the Algerian war. And I think you can understand those contemporary demonstrations when you have this also in mind and it's capital. And it was a tragic thing because it was censored and it was, it's only been made available some couple of years ago. So it's, it's I think it speaks volume to the Absolutely. connection we need to make, but also the fact that those connections are completely repressed. So. Uh, thank you so much. Um, it's been great to be initiating this story, this uh, series with, with you. Um, and it will continue. So I'm just going to announce the future dates again. On, um, on October 8, we will have Didier Fassin with a chair at the Collège de France in Public Health talking about biopolitics and unequal lives. And on October 29, Yala Kisukidi on race and hospitality. She will, in fact, question the notion of race in France and how we can talk about race today in regards with universalism. So I think it's going also another wonderful talk. And on November 9, uh, um, uh, a talk by Jean-Luc Nancy on les fondements de l'égalité. Uh, and this will continue next semester with further lectures by, uh, by Suleiman Bashir Diane, Felwin Sarr, Laure Murat. And we will keep you updated. Um, for those who are interested in the events of the center, on October 2, we are also organizing a tribute to Bernard Stiegler. So a very different project, but a fascinating one, which is also going to be done in partnership with the uh, Institut de Recherche et d'Innovation at Pompidou. So thank you so much again, Pap. It was wonderful and, and I'm very sure nice. it was absolutely necessary for our students to have that kind of talk. I'm, I'm really, really grateful. And I'm really grateful for the questions and for our respondents and our wonderful moderator as well, Laurent. And um, so thanks, thanks for to everyone, and um, we say goodbye, and see you next time for more, more lectures, more events, more seminars. Bye. Bye bye.